On election day, someone stole all my What Would Reagan Do stickers, and ever since then, I have doubled my collection. I am Kelly Heilman, and I'm a sophomore at Sewanee, the University of the South in Tennessee, and I'm a fellow for the Claire Booth Luce Policy Institute. I am sure our next speaker, as the post-presidency executive assistant to President Reagan, could really tell us what Reagan would do. I am thrilled to be here today and to have the chance to introduce Peggy Grandy. She worked backstage for the president, ensuring daily engagements ran smoothly. She was the liaison between the president, the public eye, and world leaders. She is a graduate of Pepperdine University, the founder and chief operating officer of the Quiggle Group, on the volunteer faculty at the Leadership Institute, was Reagan's post-presidency photographer, is a certified consultant for the Fascination Assessment, and is the author of, the, of her new book, The President Will See You Now, My Stories and Lessons from Ronald Reagan's Final Years, which will be for sale and signing after she finishes speaking. As a popular keynote speaker, her, ins her inspirational leadership qualities and experiences go unparalleled. So without further ado, how about we give Peggy Grandy a grand welcome. What a thrill to be here today, and a fellow Californian is here, and um, only one, th that was a very nice introduction, thank you very much for that. Um, one title, though, that I'm most proud of is I am the proud mother of four, so I feel like I'm right in my perfect demographic sweet spot. My girls, actually my third child, my daughter Paige, will be a freshman at GW next year. Any GW students here? Okay, I may want to connect with a few GW students, but she's very excited to be back here in the thick of things. and. I hope you ladies realize how fortunate you are to be here today and to be in this beautiful place and learning from all these amazing people who have incredible experiences and incredible connections that you can tap into. I never had anything like this when I was growing up. I had to figure it out all on my own and find my own way. And so take advantage of every opportunity like this that you have. Make connections, not only with the people sitting in this room, but the people who put this together and just realize what a gift this is to you. The sky truly is the limit for anything and everything you wanna do. And it can start today or this can be part of your journey. And I'm really honored to be here today and to be part of the program. So I will get started because um, I know we're a few minutes behind schedule, um, but I will plow through a bunch of stuff really quickly. I brought some pictures to share because, you know, it's one thing to talk about the president. It's another thing to actually see the president. Um, I am going to talk for a little bit about my book. It's called The President Will See You Now. Has anybody written a book in here? Has anybody thought of writing a book in here or hopes to someday? It's an amazing process. I actually never thought I would write a book, but here it is. Life is funny that way. Um, it was really an incredible process. I found writing a book to be a process of extremes. And so I sat at my computer. I wrote the book over about the course of two months, which is pretty quick. And I sat at my computer every day for 12 to 15 hours a day. And you have these thoughts in your head and these feelings in your heart. And they go through your fingers onto the keyboard. And they go up onto this screen. And it all seems very insulated from the world. And then eventually you get a couple of sheets of paper printed out at Kinko's or something and you start interacting with it and it starts looking and feeling like a book. And then one day this arrives in the mail and you will have the ultimate panic attack of, oh my goodness, what secrets did I tell my computer that now I have told the world? <laughs> because you don't really think about it when you're sitting talking just to your computer. Uh, but it's been an incredible journey. As an executive assistant, um, I found myself the tendency was to write myself out of my own story. You're used to, as an EA, being behind the scenes and being the one who stands behind people and makes sure that they look good and that they tell their story. And as an executive assistant, it was very unnatural, I guess, for me to step up and tell my story. But my publisher told me something early on, and I hope all of you will take this in mind, too. Not everybody can relate to being president of the United States. But everybody can relate to a part of your story. And so tell your story alongside whatever other story that you're telling. And I think in the pages of my book, you will find that everybody can be relate to where you're at right now, to being young and green and stepping into places that seem maybe a little too big for you right now, maybe a little intimidating right now. But trust me, eventually you will find your way, you will find your footing, and you'll realize that you can be a valued contributor in a place that originally just seemed like, I don't know if I'm going to fit in here. P press on through. You can find a place there. And unfortunately for most of us, sometimes in life, things happen that we didn't expect. 
and that we don't want and we have to work, walk through them anyway. Um, life brings challenge, it brings heartache, it brings crisis and there's never a good time for a crisis, trust me. <laughs> but in those moments of crisis, can we find a way to find balance in the imbalance? Can we find joy even in the struggle? Can we find a way to live life cheerfully with optimism for the future, even when things are really, really tough? And those are some of the stories that I try to tell in the book. And by taking you alongside with me in the pages of the book, I want you to see this man, this remarkable man, which most of you were too young to ever know anything about his presidency or his policies. And this book is really about the person. And I want you to see him through my lens. You'll get to feel the exhilaration of meeting him for the very first time. And you'll witness the outpouring of affection from people all across the nation and around the world who loved and admired and respected this man. You'll enjoy star-studded events with celebrities and world leaders and have both humorous and very sensitive, reflective moments. You'll be in the room when the devastating news about the president's Alzheimer's diagnosis is shared with myself and with the rest of the staff. And you'll actually go into the office on that day when we had to release that sad news to the nation and to the world. You'll be in President and Mrs. Reagan's home during their private years outside of the public eye. And you'll go to the President's bedside with me in a heartbreaking moment when I had to say my own goodbye to him. But in my experiences, I hope you will find your own and you'll realize that pain and heartache can produce growth and competence and confidence in your ability and that you're stronger than you ever believed you could be. I hope that you will realize that life is a beautiful circle and even in crisis, it can end as it began, hopeful, joyful, optimistic, full of faith and love for others and in this remarkable nation, even when it's not the fairy tale ending that we all wanted. And these are some of the lessons that you'll find in the pages of this book. And what a remarkable couple of months it has been since the launch of this book. I guess I knew that the flag-waving, Reagan-loving, patriotic people of the nation would love the book. Um, so I'm proud to have been featured in the Washington Times, the 700 Club, a bunch of Fox Business shows, American Rifleman, Conservative Book Club. But I think what I'm even more proud of is the fact that this book has been featured in People Magazine and on the Today Show and the Huffington Post, and was even listed as a top must read in Harper's Bazaar fashion magazine for women. Why all the interest, do you think? I'd like to think it's a good book, but even more than that, I think there's a longing for those Reagan-esque values of civility and of kindness and of faith and optimism and all the things that we say we value that we want so desperately to see on display in America again. And I think people are finding that in the pages of this book, and I have been so thrilled that this book's been widely received, not just on the right, but those who maybe are just curious about this man as well. So I want to take you into the pages of the book, and I want to have you meet him, meet Ronald Reagan, for the very first time as I met him. I'm going to embarrass myself, I'll tell you, but it's already in the book, so it's out there. I'm embarrassed. <laughs> So I went in for my interview, and this is after my interview. Waiting in the lobby felt almost like a dream state. It was so foreign to anything I had ever done or experienced, yet somehow felt strangely familiar, as if this was all meant to be. The door nearest me suddenly swung open, and four Secret Service agents in suits and ties, with earpieces, radios, and with guns holstered under their coats, walked hurriedly toward me. Were they going to shoot me? Arrest me? Did they know who I was? Did they know what I was doing there? And then behind the lead agent, I saw two older gentlemen in golf attire. Wait, was it? Could it possibly be? It was, it was the president and his golf buddy, Walter Annenberg. In all of my interview prep and planning, it had never occurred to me that I might actually meet President Reagan. I didn't know what to do, so I thought about what I would do if the flag were passing by. So I stood up straight, placing my hand over my heart, <laughs> not even looking at him, staring nobly off, unthreatening, into the distance. I'm certain I looked completely ridiculous. <laughs> but instead of walking past me, he walked right toward me. He looked me in the eye and extended his hand. I shook his hand and introduced myself. Well, hello, Peggy. It's nice to meet you, said the 40th President of the United States of America. I had imagined him as a 10-foot tall giant. After all, he had been a movie star a governor and president of the United States. 
He had tackled communism head on, fixed the domestic economy, and solved many of the world's problems. Yet here he was, an ordinary man, just over six feet tall. His hair and pictures appeared jet black, but up close I saw touches of gray, evidence of his 78 years. He was ruddy and rosy cheeked, full of life, happiness, and vitality. His smile was more asymmetrical than I had noticed in photos, and it was perfect in its imperfect way. And those eyes, a wonderful, bright, true blue, and carrying so much joy. He was gone as quickly as he appeared, taking all the people, the energy, and the aura of power and importance with him. The office was suddenly eerily still. Selena, the woman who had interviewed me, then walked through the door, the same door, grinning ear to ear, having witnessed my salute. You should have warned me, I said, still trembling inside. She said, it's pretty incredible meeting him for the first time, isn't it? It's much better, though, to meet him the way you did. And though I felt I had horribly embarrassed myself, I had to agree. She then handed me parking validation stickers, which you need in California. I was a college student. I wasn't sure how I was going to get my car out of the parking lot. She said, I was going to wait until I, to call you until tomorrow and leave you hanging in suspense for at least a while. But I already know we want you to work here with us. So can you start interning on Monday? Yes, I could. <laughs> So I held it all together until I was outside the building. I didn't know whether to shout for joy, cry, or drop to my knees in prayers of thanksgiving. I was overwhelmed by all that had just happened. I started laughing out loud. The preposterousness of it all. Me, him, this office, Fox Plaza, Avenue of the Stars. We had met. He shook my hand. And now I work for him? I didn't have any idea what Monday would hold, but I knew with confidence that my life would never be the same after that day. And in fact, had already changed. So that is from my book. Um, I'm going to buzz through some slides real quick because I want to talk about what leadership looks like. And regardless of your title, your position on the organizational chart or within a company or a group, you can be, should be, and are seeing yourselves as leaders. That's why you're here today. You're not here to just blend in. You're here to be leaders. Ronald Reagan showed me that how you lead and how you live are completely connected. There's no disconnection. And so as you think about your leadership, you also need to think about how you're living your life. Are you a good role model? Are you an example for others? Are you inspiring and optimistic like he was? We can laugh at the hairstyles and the fashions of the 80s and 90s. It's OK. Hopefully, we've evolved a little past that. Um, but I consider myself to be one of the luckiest women in the world. If you don't know my story, I started working for Ronald Reagan in 1989, right after he left the White House and returned to Los Angeles. I worked for him then at, for the next 10 years until 1999, when he left the public eye. My job ran the spectrum. I was his executive assistant. I sat right outside his door, managed everything from his correspondence to phone calls. Everybody from Buckingham Palace to the White House would call, um, interacted with ordinary citizens who were patriotic and had written into him. My job ran the spectrum, everything from greeting people as they walked in the door. It could be a world leader, seems very um, important job, bring them in, introduce them to the president, take their photos, bring in their lunch, and then afterwards, I would clear the dishes. It was a really small staff. You did anything and everything you needed to do. I did really important things like making sure he had cash in his pocket when he needed to get his hair cut. The president didn't always carry cash. Um, and made sure he had toothpaste in his bathroom when he needed to brush his teeth. You know, really important things like that. But they were important. Um, and then so my job completely <laughs> ran the spectrum. And it was fun to go back and talk about all of those different roles in the book. We got to travel with him and being alongside him, watching him interact with the world was always special. What I noticed about him and I think is so crucial about a good leader is there were not two Ronald Reagans. The, peop the people who respected and admired him in public, when they got to meet him in private, they realized he was the same person. And in fact, he may have even been a better person <laughs> than they thought he was in a public persona. But I don't know how many of you have ever met like a celebrity or a star or somebody you had really looked forward to meeting. And a lot of times we've put them on a pedestal and we meet them and sometimes aren't they a little disappointing? And you think, I kind of wish I hadn't met them <laughs> because I maybe liked them more before I knew them. 
That was not the case with Ronald Reagan, and what a great example of somebody who was public persona and private persona were completely in sync. And as you think of your own leadership journey, is your public persona the same as your private persona? You know, as a mom, believe me, I see this all the time. And with teenagers, I have got my peanut gallery of criticism going all the time. <laughs> but it's good, and they call, they hold me to account, and they make sure that my forward-facing persona is the same person that I am at home. And often, unfortunately, in relationships and friendships and families, don't we give the best to the world, and we sometimes give the worst to the people that we love the most? How important it is to think about our leadership from how we live, how we lead, and how we're interacting, not only with people in public, but the people who know us best. What will they say about you? My job um, was anything but ordinary, but when I look back on all the star-studded events, probably the things I treasure the most are those days, if you could call them ordinary days in the office, when it was just the president and I and a small staff working together. Of course, there were special signatures, special events. We got to travel on planes like the Forbes plane. Um, I was his post-presidency photographer, so there I'm behind the lens of the camera. I got to witness special moments like this before black tie events. Here's Lady Margaret Thatcher with Mrs. Reagan. The president's pointing out something in his library. And then I got to capture moments like this after the event, <laughs> which I love. The ladies have their shoes kicked off and their stocking feet, and the president's got his eyes rolled in the back of his head to say, come on, stop talking so we can go home. <laughs> These were real people, and it was fun to catch them in those real moments. And this is one of my favorite pictures, which looks ordinary enough until you realize that I snapped this photo as soon as the elevator doors open and Margaret Thatcher walked out. And if you look at their faces, you realize they're excited this, to see her. She was a friend of theirs, not just a political ally. And that's how Ronald Reagan did diplomacy. Diplomacy the Reagan way was not about rhetoric. It was all about relationships. And it wasn't just about politics. It was very personal. So post-presidency, all those years, we had people like Gorbachev come by, Prime Minister Nakasone from Japan, Helmut Kohl from Germany, Brian Mulroney from um, Canada, Lech Walesa from Poland. They came because they wanted to. They liked this man. They had a relationship with him. They didn't have to come and pay respects to Ronald Reagan post-presidency for protocol or diplomatic reasons. They came because they wanted to. They were connected to him personally and wanted to stay connected to him. Even Mother Teresa. I met a saint. How cool was that? <laughs> Didn't know it at the time. <laughs> he was a man of authenticity from black tie to boots. He was comfortable in his own skin. He was comfortable in who he was. Um, he loved entertaining people up at the ranch. Uh, maybe some of you have been up to the ranch program, which is wonderful. But you're probably surprised when you see that Ronald Reagan's ranch house is pretty modest <laughs> and pretty small. It's not this palatial estate. Um, so he loved bringing people, even like Margaret Thatcher, Brian Mulroney, up to the ranch. There was nothing like seeing the president behind the wheel of the Jeep. He hadn't driven for eight years, so when he was buying the wheel, you definitely wanted to step back from the road. <laughs> you look at him, he looks like a little kid, you know, so happy to be driving. I don't think his Secret Service agent in the back um, quite shares his enthusiasm, but um, there was, it was fun to see him up at the ranch just living his ranch life. One of my favorite stories, and I tell about it in the book, is um, uh, Gorbachev was going to be coming up to the ranch, and the president wanted to give him a gift, as always, but he decided he was going to give him a Stetson cowboy hat. So he asked me if I could find a Stetson for Gorbachev. Of course, I said yes, and then I thought, how on earth do I figure out Gorbachev's hat size? So back in the day, before you could pop an email or Google, I go through literally a worldwide quest in my book trying to find out what hat size Gorbachev wore Thankfully, when the cameras were rolling and the pictures were being snapped, Gorbachev took the hat out of the box, put it on his head, and it fit perfectly. But it was quite the ordeal <laughs> to make that happen. I don't know if you know Ronald Reagan's life story, but he came from very humble beginnings. And I think he's a great lesson and example for who, where you come from does not define who you can be. We look at these presidents and think they must have all these perfect lives. Ronald Reagan was born in the middle of the Great Depression. He was born in a snowstorm in a little apartment above a store in Tampico, Illinois, which is just a wide spot in the middle of central Illinois. His father was an alcoholic. Their family was very poor. If you looked at his life on paper, you would say, this man will never amount to anything. And yet he was raised by a mother who used to say to him all the time, 
God has a plan for everyone, and seemingly random twists of fate are all part of his plan, and in the end, everything will work out for the best. And when you're raised by a mother like that who has faith and optimism, it really changed his life. It set him on a trajectory forward that his circumstances did not define him. He'd never looked at small town America as being something he needed to overcome, but it was the very foundation for all that he would become. He saw the values of faith and of community and of church life and of friendships and of people falling upon hard times and their neighbors helping them out as being the very foundation on which he would build a great America in the future. So don't let your past define you just because you've come from humble beginnings or it looks like the cards are stacked against you. That doesn't define where you can wind up. He was a man of incredible optimism. You know, his nickname was always the great communicator, but I also think he was always known as the great optimist as well. Most of you in this room, maybe a few in the back, remember the 1970s, but maybe you've read about the 70s, and things were really bad here in America in the 70s. Inflation was high, taxes were high, unemployment was high, and worst of all, America had really lost faith in itself. And I know a lot of that sounds familiar to where we are now as well. But Ronald Reagan took office and on day one of his presidency, he began saying, it's morning in America. There's a new dawn ahead. There's a shining city on the hill and we are all part of it. And he inspired and reinvigorated a great nation with optimism. Of course, he had to follow that up with policies, but American morale turned around almost overnight and that made all the difference in the world. And so as you're looking ahead at your own leadership journey, realize the things you do the plans you implement, um, all are important, but can you do it with optimism? And there's no better way to inspire loyalty and to inspire the team around you than to do it with a vision for the future that is optimistic and forward thinking. He, before Donald Trump, he was the oldest president to ever assume the presidency, and yet he was always talking about the future, always connected with the next generation, always thinking about what came after him, that he was just playing his role, but much would go on long after him. And as a leader, what's the legacy you're leaving behind you? Are you bringing up people behind you who will lead and take over after you're gone? He was a man of humility, which seems odd because President of the United States, you wouldn't think he's very humble, but he was a very humble man. He kept this sign on his desk that said, there's no limit to what a man can do and where he can go, so long as he doesn't mind who gets the credit. And I love that. It applies to women, too, even though it says man. Um, it applies to women, too. He not only lived his life that way, he expected those of us who worked around him to live our lives that way as well. He was a man with an incredible sense of humor. He used humor to put people at ease, to break tension, sometimes to make a very poignant point that he didn't want to be confrontational about. He would use humor. It's a great skill and tactic. I'm not saying go buy a joke book, but you can take things seriously without taking yourself too seriously. And he didn't mind being the butt of his own joke and using self-deprecating humor, which is a very effective way to diffuse and kind of bring, people, bring people's guard down. I used to say he would disarm people with charm and really with kindness and a gentle spirit and a good sense of humor. You can usually soften even the harsh, harshest critic. He was a man of incredible respect, whether it was presidents that came before him or presidents that came after him. He respected the office. Politics weren't something that had to divide people. We didn't hate people back then because we disagreed. We would always, he would always look for we may disagree on a hundred things, but are there three things we agree upon? And let's use that as a starting point for moving forward. He had great respect for women. He talks about his mother as being the most important person in his early life. Um, obviously, his love story with Mrs. Reagan is so well documented. I actually write a chapter about Mrs. Reagan in my book as well. Mother Teresa, he was the first president to put a woman on the Supreme Court, something he was always very proud of. And he was a man of incredible patriotism. And you would expect that, I would think, from a president, but this was something that came from his soul. And time and time again, I would see him behind the scenes when people would come in and sing patriotic music or play something patriotic. And you would see this man stand up, tears welling in his eyes, singing along, tapping his toes in time. He loved this country. He loved everything it stood for. And what an honor to see this great patriot so closely. 
He was a man of incredible gratitude. He was grateful for the opportunity of having served as President of the United States. Um, he, he, that picture, he was receiving the Presidential Medal of Freedom from President Bush in the White House. This is on the plane on the way home. I snapped this picture, and I love it because it's a long flight home from Washington, D.C. back to L.A. So he took off his suit coat, but he left his medal on and he wore it all the way home. And you think, here's a man who's received every trophy, every award, every certificate, you know, always gets the gold sticker, right? And yet it meant something to him. He didn't just take it off and hand it to me and say, put it in my library. He wore that medal all the way home. It meant something to him. It meant something to him that he had had the honor of representing the people of this great nation. The other thing, and I may convict some of you here, but this photo was convicting to me when I stopped and looked at it a little closer. What is he doing in this photo, if you can see? What's he writing? What's he doing? Writing his thank you notes, okay? Is anybody in here a crazy note writer? Oh, wow! Good job, good job. So. This man, by the way, had an executive assistant who would have been more than happy to write his thank you notes. But this was a man who was disciplined and grateful, and he wanted to say what he wanted to say the way he wanted to say it at that time. And what a great example to me of discipline and of just an attitude, living life grateful for every opportunity. So this convicts me, and I travel quite a bit, and so I always take note cards with me, and every time I get on the plane before, you know, before sometimes we even take off, I pull out my note cards and I start writing my thank yous because if this man can do it, I certainly can. And I would challenge those of you who are not note writers, if you try it, I want you to email me or drop me a note and tell me how it changes your life because if you are looking to stand out in this world right now that is so saturated with social media and with emails and with technology, the one surefire way to get noticed and to be remembered is to drop a handwritten note. It takes you less than a dollar and you can do it for less than five minutes. And we spend so much time on other aspects of our networking and our outreach and we miss the easiest, cheapest thing. Doesn't matter what your penmanship is like, don't use a paper ripped out, you know, like spiral and use a decent sheet of paper. Use your best penmanship, but nobody's going to judge your penmanship, con you know, it's not a penmanship contest. I can't tell you how often I travel and I run into people and they will say, oh my gosh, you sent me a note back, you know, wherever, I still have it, from 10 years ago or something. When's the last time you got a handwritten note? Do you remember? Do you remember what the stationery looked like? Did you judge the penmanship? I bet you remember who it came from, and I bet you remember how you felt when you received it. And I'm the queen of multitasking, but when I'm writing a note, I cannot do anything else. And so that person has my full attention for however long I write that note, and people know that. So I would challenge you, if you are not in the habit of doing that, I would definitely start doing that. And then let me know how it goes for you and how it changes your life and your career. Ronald Reagan actually for Christmas one year um, gave me this as one of the things I treasure most. It's a doodle, it's a cowboy. I like to think it's maybe a self-portrait. Um, but one year for Christmas, he brought this to me, and this was my Christmas present, and he said, Peggy, I wanted to, to do something more for you, but you do all my shopping. And so I wasn't quite sure <laughs> how I could you know, do something for you without getting you involved. So he had taken pen to paper and done this doodle for me. And what a great um, example just of gratitude for my role in his life and for the relationship that we had. I was very appreciative. The world knew him for so many things. I knew him as a man of extreme kindness. It, this looks like a prom picture, but we actually, I was telling him that I had just gotten engaged to my husband, Greg. We just celebrated our 27th wedding anniversary. Um, I got married and had three of my four kids while I was working for the president, so those were some crazy busy years. My mom was not a mother who worked outside the home. I didn't have a role model of knowing how that could work, if that could even be possible, and so it was a space that I really tried to navigate on my own. I write a lot about that in my book. Um, I'm very transparent about it. it was, it was tough. It's not for everybody, um, but I'm very transparent about my journey with that, and I felt like God had called me to be in the place that I was, and so that was the place I needed to be. And then I write also very clearly about the time when I felt like God's hand of blessing was no longer there, and I needed to be home with my family. And so if some of you are 
trying to figure out how you're going to navigate that space someday, I encourage you to, to just walk alongside my journey. I don't have all the answers, but I'll tell you how I did it and how I navigated it and how I figured it out. And everybody's in a different place. But I did get married. I had three of my four kids, my son, Taylor, my daughter, Courtney, who's my second. My third, my daughter, Paige, who's the one who's coming to GW. She's grown a little since then. And my fourth, my daughter, Jocelyn, at which time when I told Mrs. Reagan that I was having my fourth, she pulled me out into the hallway and she said, Peggy, you know how this is happening, right? <laughs> <laughs> so four and no more. Not really a conversation I wanted to have with the former first lady or anybody really, but yeah, four and no more. <laughs> but it was great with the kids growing up with the president. They treated him like he was a grandpa and he was so good and wonderful to them celebrating birthdays and Halloween and Christmas. and. My son had, does have better manners now. He jumped up on the president's desk because he wanted to give him a real hug, not a leg hug. So he <laughs> climbed up on his desk and just a lot of fun over the years. My husband had the great privilege of playing golf regularly with President Reagan because as his friends got older, they weren't able to get out to the golf course. So Mrs. Reagan would sometimes call on Friday afternoon and say, Greg, um, any chance you could be Ronnie's fourth for tomorrow at golf? So of course he would say yes. And then he would put down the phone and he would look at me and he'd say, Peggy, I was really looking forward to mowing the lawn tomorrow and working down the list of chores I know you have for me, but duty calls. I must serve my country. I must play golf with the president. <laughs> so I did what every good wife would do. I hired a handyman and a gardener, and we've stayed happily married. And he got to golf. <laughs> So really, I learned anything and everything I will ever need to know about how to live and how to lead from this man. And it didn't come in a list. It came from his life. And your legacy is not written after you're gone. It's written with every single day of your life. And that means now. And that means today. And that's a little bit frightening maybe for some of you to think, oh, wow, this is my legacy? Yeah, it's already started. And here's the beautiful part of life. If you don't like the legacy you're writing for your life right now, you can change that. And you can fix that. And you can point it in the direction you want it to go. And that can change and start today. Lead and live as if your legacy depends upon it. Because it does. I got to watch this man every day behind the scenes and seeing him step out into the world and watching how people respond was just overwhelming. Um, he affected people in unbelievable ways and that was never more clear than when he passed away. And we watched people wait in line for hours and hours just to walk past his flag draped casket. We walked, watched people line the streets and stop with flags and signs and flowers just to watch his motorcade pass by. He left an amazing legacy, and I think we miss him still here in America because we miss that feeling of loving ourselves and loving America that we had when he was president. So I want to close with one passage from the book, but I'll take a couple of questions first, and then I know um, lunch, I think, is after this. So a couple of questions. Does anybody have a question? No questions. OK. Does this come out? Can I walk and talk? Okay, we're going to walk and talk. Okay. So, where's the other mic? Okay. So, my name is Kara. I'm from University of Wisconsin. Um, and so one thing that I was wondering is what's your favorite story of him? Because I know you have a lot, and I know you know a lot of stories are really touching, but what's your favorite? So the favorite quick one, and it's not maybe a story so much as just a behavior of his. He was so sweet. So I was in my 20s when I was working for him, and he was in his 80s. And it was little things like he would reach over and hold my elbow as we would go up and down the stairs. You guys probably don't even know. Like, that's the chivalrous thing for men to do. But just little things like that. He was so aware of my presence, and even though I worked for him, he was always very aware of me being there, um, he always looked out for me, made sure, you know, one time we had a, a security scare, and they cleared the room, and I mean, Secret Service literally grabs him and goes, and he stopped and grabbed me and made sure that I left with them, and I thought, he did not have to do that, and so he was just always very aware and appreciative and protective, I think, of me, even though it was my job to do that for him. Wisconsin, I miss you there with your governor. Oh, really? You're so lucky. You have a great <laughs> governor. <laughs> we don't in California, but yeah. I, 
can say that. It's true. <laughs> that is not opinion. That is true. Yeah, I think there was one in the back. Who has the other mic? Okay. Whoever has the other mic. Hi. My name is Juliana. Um, um, I was just wondering, um, I know like I was raised with Nancy Reagan and Res oh, President Reagan as like just the greatest thing that I've ever walked the planet. And so I was just wondering what is a personal piece of advice, you know, like behind closed doors that he would have given you that you could kind of pass on to us. I'm sure you outlined it in your book, but just something really personal that like he kind of, not you, but like. <laughs> Not crazy or so, but just like something sweet that maybe he said to you and something that you've carried through your life. I think the impression that he left on me, and again, he never lectured me like, here's the things you should do. I think a couple of things that he impressed upon me is there's always a better way. There's a better way to say it. There's a better way to do it. There's a better way to treat people. And so are we content with just fitting in or doing a good job? Or are we always looking, is there a nicer way to do that? And here was a man who was in a fishbowl. I mean, everybody's watching everything he does and says. There's a lot of pressure on him, and yet he was a very cheerful warrior. And I think I learned that too, that you can, always, you can have optimism even in the middle of chaos. Um, you can find joy, and you can find a sense of peace even when things seem really tumultuous. Um, little things like language, instead of saying, never forget, he would say, always remember. Um, is there a better way to set up a room, to greet people, to, when they're leaving, what can we give them as they depart? What are the impressions that we're leaving on people? He sometimes only had a split second to make an impression on people. I mean, I was fortunate. I got to sit outside his door every day for 10 years. But he knew that when he rode in the elevator with somebody, and they were maybe there in the elevator for 10 seconds with him, that was their one brush with him. And would he make that memorable for them? And time and time again, I watched him do it. And you know he had to get tired of that. But what is people's one brush with you? What's their one moment with you? And is it memorable? There's always a way to leave a positive and lasting impression, regardless of how quick. Yeah. That's for me, so much. Uh, my name's Lindsay. Um, I really value uh, what you said at the very beginning, you said my, my greatest uh, position is to be a mother of four. And I think for all of us seeking a position in this field um, and also my valuing a future motherhood, can you talk more about the balance of your career? And it sounds like you felt like the Lord had brought you there specifically, but then also the gift of motherhood. Can you speak a little bit more about that? Um, I, I'll say two things. First of all, you know, I don't claim to be a policy expert but I have a voice that's valuable in the policy arena because I can tell you what those policies do to me and to my family, um, to our communities, to our schools. And so your life experience adds value to every arena. And so I may not know the ins and outs of every bill on the hill, but I can tell you what that's gonna do to my family. And so just realize that you have an important and valued voice in a space, even if it seems very insulated or I'm not an expert on that. Um, I'll also kind of debunk a misnomer. I really don't like that term of work-life balance. Work-life balance. It makes you feel like, okay, I need to equal work and equal play. Well, by the time you take sleep out a few hours of the night, you're not left with much of the day. And if you're a working professional, it puts a lot of pressure on you to be balanced in time with your kids. I instead sub subscribe to a theory I like to say work-life presence where you are be there fully when i am at work i wanted to work like a tornado so that i got everything done and i could get out the door on time and i wanted to give the best of what i had to where i was and then when i got home i wanted to be a tornado of the best mom <laughs> that i could possibly be in the amount of time that i had and so even though there wasn't sorry this is my a little weird um there wasn't always a balance time wise I wanted to be balanced in my approach to both. Could I be fully present in each place and be the best of what I wanted to be and bring to each space? And so that, I think, relieved me of the pressure of needing to be everything to everybody all the time. Um, just can we find, can we be present rather than balanced? Maybe one more. I don't know what our timing is like. Maybe one more? No more? Okay, that's fine. Do I have time to read one quick little passage? Okay, all right. 
anybody been up to the Reagan Library? I want to read a quick passage of what it was like to go to the Reagan Library with Ronald Reagan himself. And, sorry, I have it tabbed here. Okay. One particular visitor who loved going up to the library time and time again was President Reagan himself. Whether it was to showcase this beautiful historic facility to a friend, a head of state, or to open a new exhibit, there was nothing like walking through the museum with him. People had come to learn about him, never imagining they would ever meet him. It was a little like the movie Night at the Museum for some of the guests there, where history literally came to life. People responded in two distinct ways when they saw him. The first group, as I had done, took a step back, as if seeing him from a distance was enough or maybe even too much. The second group made a beeline for him, which drew a quick response from the Secret Service, putting out their hand to shake his. It was as if they had rehearsed this moment a thousand times and were fully prepared when their chance meeting occurred. There wasn't much in between, an interesting, though unscientific, observation of mine. Kids, I noticed, usually fell into the second category, bold and unafraid to approach him. They loved him, and he loved nothing more than being surrounded by a giggling group of school kids at his library. I usually had to pull him along to keep him on schedule. The kids would boo me, and the president would just laugh and point to me, saying, she's telling me I need to go now. I better do what she says. One time we were getting ready to leave the library, and the sky was especially clear, and the sun was beginning to set. We saw a distant glimmer of the ocean in the distance. It felt as if we were on top of the world and could see forever atop a steep slope down to distant houses and fields. The president paused for a moment, and as we stood silently side by side, he looked over his left shoulder at his future memorial site, which was poorly disguised behind a few low hedges, the place where he and Mrs. Reagan would eventually be buried. He squared his body so that the angle perfectly matched that of the burial site, and he turned to me and said, I think I'll like this view. He laughed to diffuse an otherwise awkward moment, and in spite of making me smile on the outside, just the thought of the day when we would lay him to rest there pained me deeply. He, however, seemed unaffected by the joke, comfortable to the core in who he was and in the remarkable life he had been given. I savored this quiet, peaceful moment and lingered extra long that day, both to enjoy the incredible view in front of me and the iconic profile to my left, lit beautifully with the warm glow of the setting California sun. Thank you so much for having me here today. Thank you.